Hello, everybody, and welcome again to the wisdomfactory.net to our conversations that matter. And today it is about love and relationships. And we have again our, let's say, already very at home guest, Dr. Tom Habib, and talking about his newest findings in his research about couple, couples, I would say, no? Um, and actually the title is How Couples Can Grow Together on the Spiral. And spiral with spiral, we mean the spiral of spiral dynamics, the levels of development. And before we go into that, by the way, we have already done some of these uh, videos and you can see them on the wisdomfactory.net and search for T T Tom Habib and you will find, I think four or five we did already, Tom, uh, on yeah. your research beginning from the beginning, let's say, and s slowly it has developed and become different. And today it seems to be quite different. So it's a real update. So, but before we go into it, um, uh, can you just introduce yourself briefly because there might be somebody who, you know, doesn't know you. <laughs> sure. Uh, hello, Martin and Heidi. Um, my name is Tom Habib. Uh, by profession, I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in couples. And like many folks who come into Integral, um, it's kind of fun to see what Integral does to the work you're already doing, how it organizes it, and, you know, it creates both lateral and hierarchical dimensions we wouldn't have seen otherwise. And in part, that's what we're going to expand upon today, uh, where most people are in what works to create a nice solid foundation for couples. Mm -hmm. And you are in California. I'm Heidi Hernlein. I'm in Italy. And there is Martin Ocek, and he is in Istanbul. So we are really far away from each <laughs> other. And thankfully, we can be together to explore these new findings of you. So, uh, Martin, do you want to, to say something and then we go into it? No, I'm really looking forward to uh, advancing to the leading edge with Tom. He's always a step ahead of everybody else. So this is really <laughs> exciting to be with you, Tom, again today. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Can I move go, forward? Yeah, right ahead. So, um, what I want to show first is, okay, you should be able to see that. We're going to talk about how do you develop a solid container to handle the emotional bandwidth and the intensity of intimacy. And it is this container that really has to be able to transmute the intensity of the feeling in order for us to reach the higher stages, which is, you know, in uh, my couple's line model, stage uh, four and stage five. And you should be able to see the couple's line right here. So today we're going to talk about this. How do we strengthen stage three, the relational stage? And I'm going to do a deeper dive into the specific skills necessary in order to effectively utilize the intensity that will come up in intimacy. Because once we're able to strengthen that, then it becomes much easier to go into first love, which uh, we did previously on, you know, parts one through four, Heidi, uh, on the Wisdom Factory. Yeah. And then we did a contrast between the skill level of first love and spiritual love when we did the two, uh, December 2018 uh, video cast that people can find on uh, parts um, on De December 2018. Yeah, and people can find that either on the wisdomfactor.net or also on your website, drtomabib.com. Yep. So any one of those, you can get, get a deeper dive into how do you actually utilize the relational stage and get up uh, on, into there. So if I can go back to screen share, I apologize for a little bit of lumpiness on this. And you should be able to see most of it now. Yes. There's a concept I want, we need to add. 
we need to add the concept of both regression that is a process to which we get to dependency. Regression is the process, dependency is that state experience unique to intimacy. And we know this level of re regression in that it's only with our intimate other that we can do things like baby talk, certain types of cuddling, different levels of vulnerability, and sometimes with the sense of urgency that vulnerability arises up, we're all familiar with, um, or the, the need for immediate attention. And what we're doing while we're doing regression as process into intimacy, uh, uh, dependency, it's a trend to a younger state and feeling that needs to be re-experienced um, as one's younger self. <coughs> Excuse me. Carl Jung said it's an attempt to get at something necessary. So you, you can see why this is a you know necessary part of intimacy, because if we're going to transcend and include all aspects of ourself, it really is uh, the regression and the dependency where it shows up uh, for us. So if I can move on. Sure. Um, you, regressions, what's unique to the intimate dyad, we've already said. The larger world doesn't want to deal with that part of you. They expect you to function in your adult mold. So the amount of anger you can express that's socially appropriate in the rules of discourse and the larger society is limited. And when people go over the top, they obviously become a problem um, or they're right up to the point of law enforcement. How much disappointment, how much sensitivity, how much rejection, certainly there's a limit in sexual feelings that uh, we, we get to express in the larger world. But in intimacy, everything goes, everything's possible. We get to show up in all phases of ourself. And it's how you do that that is important. Um, on this one, this was an article in Associated Press, and the article was about a woman who was upset with her husband at church because he looked at another woman in church, and she literally uh, ran him over in the parking lot of the church. Um, this is not good regression. Um, this is not okay to do uh, at this level. And we know that because we've seen in other circumstances one of the most dangerous things police officers walk into is, you remember me saying this, Heidi? Domestic violence. That's right, Martin. It's domestic violence. And it's because ultimately you can end up, um, you know, dealing with somebody that is tapping a level of themselves that is pretty immature. And if they're that hurt and an unresponsive authority figure shows up, then we have all the ingredients of something that's not going to look very good. So to go back where we were. And sorry. I get the biggest screen so everybody can see it. Okay. So that's not good regression. So when one regresses, it's initiated with a more or less reasonable expectation that your intimate partner will respond accordingly. Now, here's the system in the lower right. If you don't have this container that can transmute this level of intensity, you're in trouble. There's almost not a couple I don't see that I don't strengthen this container because it has to be able to work. If I'm gonna get them exposed to the higher levels, this has to work real well. Susan Johnson said this, it is how these needs and desires are enacted in the context of vulnerability and perceived danger that creates problems. And for the most part, I agree with her. The only problem with this, this is a static interpretation. She doesn't have a sense of a line of development you may be able to see in this, um, you know, in terms of doing this. So 
when a couple is together, I look at who regresses when. There are times it's not appropriate to be regressing. Like you're on your way to the airport, you're late, you know, one's yelling at the other one because they're feeling frustrated. That doesn't help. That burns up the um, tolerance and the goodwill in a relationship. We don't want regression then. We don't want regress regression when there are real children in the backseat fighting. You know, the couple needs to put their backs together and get through it. We're looking at the quality of the regression. Anger is always low quality. It's motivated by a need, but you're utilizing your spouse in a destructive way when you do that. Is it reciprocal, the regression? Can both people give and take the position of regression? How do they signal the opportunity to exchange uh, the regressive position in the relationship? The dialogue has to carry language and signals that, that say, you know, it's my turn. I want to go there. Do they regress at the same time? That's a disaster. C can you sense the uh, problem we're regressing at the same time? You know, when we say this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it turns into a train wreck because there's no adult in the room. And uh, that's what we'll, we'll be diving into a little bit bigger, uh, a little deeper in a moment. So to get right back there. Oops, got to repopulate it. Tom, do we have a little space for a question? Yeah, please. About anger, you know, in, in, in my workshops, I often, you know, we also look at the, at the ladder and a lot of people feel that they don't have a healthy egocentric integration. Yeah. So there is repressed or dissociated, they're very dissociated from anger and boundaries and expressing their power. Yep. And so you said anger, you know, is a low, low vibration. When, yep. it's, when it's probably unconsciously expressed and projected on the partner. But what about if it is repressed and people feel like they have no choice and no control, no boundaries, no power? Absolutely. They can't participate in this space. And, you know, we recognize that's upper left unresolved issues at that moment. Mm -hmm. And because they haven't resolved their own inner world issues, they can't get on the same level and participate. So absolutely right. Even the avoidance of that intensity, even anger, the avoidance of conflict is standing outside of the field of participation. Mm -hmm. so, so you articulate a necessary upper left um, uh, process that's necessary to fully uh, participate in intimacy. And so what is the advice for someone who is with a outwardly or a person who gets off triggered and projects their anger outwardly and they basically freeze or or flight because they're not in touch with their healthy anger and boundaries they need to do a little bit of individual work and strengthen that process before they can participate because we know in intimacy it gets a little hot and if you can't you know down regulate some of the emotion on the upper right we've talked about before, or keep the focus upon which, you know, you're trying to assert in that moment and then stay structural. And that's what we're going to talk about today is that lower right process of be conscious of where, what we're doing in this moment with all this intensity. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. There, there's so many things going on. It, it, I always say that there's a lot of psychologists that don't want to do couples therapy because from every quadrant, issues are hitting you with two different people. Mm. And then there's the interaction effect going on um, also. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, to go back and make this larger. Okay, so I gotta repopulate this, we're almost done. Is dependency avoided by either person? This happens quite often. Quite often they'll pick a person to express those types of feelings about the relationship 
typically you can most people can see a man would do this but then they end up resentful in time in the relationship what is the quality of the nurturance when the other person's in a dependent position can they really attune to the person and help soothe them so that it becomes a safe place they go okay so um, I'm going to show you the model right now so that we can get fluid in this. And like I said, I do this with every couple. And this is how I do it when I'm with a couple. Uh, this is a, a, the only thing I don't use a PowerPoint. I write it on the back of my pad. But it starts with this notion. We start life so dependent, we don't even know we're dependent. It's the middle of the nighttime and we're screaming and it's like magic that our needs get met. Now, from mom's perspective, it's two o'clock in the morning. She elbows dad and says, you get up. He says, perhaps, no way. She gets out of bed, mumbles unsavory things going down the hallway, a little upset, sticks her fingers in the diaper, uh, not wet, checks the clothing, not hot, sticks a bottle in the child's mouth, hungry. Doesn't look so magical to me. This de dependency that we never lose, I want to call C, C for child. Now, when I call a child, it's only descriptive. Heidi, earlier you, you talked about transactional analysis. And those of you that um, are familiar with it, I am using actually some of the nomenclature of it, but I'm not entirely using it. But any kind of lower right analysis of a system is an analysis of transaction on it. So we all have this seed, the dependency. Part of raising a child is teaching them how to put their immediate needs aside in order to go for long-term goals, like eating healthy, having the discipline to do your homework, Take it on responsibility and being able to do chores, uh, being able to be there for another person. You push your immediate needs aside to be there for another person. When we have that, we're an adult. So everyone has both sides of this more or less reasonably, reasonably developed. And when they fall in love, and so um, I'm going to talk about the heterosexual relationship here so as not to confuse myself, but I believe this applies to all relationships. Um, when we add another adult and they fall in love, um, I, for those on audio, I have the woman on the right. She has the adult on top, the C on the bottom. I have the male on the left. He has the adult on top, the C on bottom. And uh, eventually, I'm going to draw lines between them. Now, what we've said already is what characterizes the intimate relationship above all others is the strength and the intensity in which the C reemerges. Um, does that make sense, uh, what I'm saying? Yes, so, it is for me. Absolutely, yes. For me, and me it too. comes in this relationship that... You know, this is where we get whole. And then all the lower left fantasies, remember the um, child in the middle of the night, their experience is the oceanic feeling of I had a need and the need gets met. That's called the golden fantasy in the psychoanalytic literature. And it exists in all our relationships to this day. I got the ch a chance to study with the professor that wrote that in the literature. And I still, when I, I'm dealing with Christine, I still use as a litmus test occasionally in my thoughts, if she loved me, she would know what I need. Isn't that amazing? Is it still persists, even though I know better than that, but there's still a part of me that goes there and that's the infant acquisition of dependency in that experience that never goes away. Make sense? Yes. So, to move on. Okay. So, 
what I'm looking for in the relationship, and I'm drawing a line between the woman's A and the man's C, when he's there at C, which means he has a need, she has to be at A. <coughs> Excuse me. From A, there's only two things you can do. You can reflectively listen or you can agree to do something. So you, you want to write those down. I'm going to test you later on. You can reflectively listen when you're in the A position or you can agree to something. So um, reflectively listen means I, I love to give this absurd example of, say, if Christine's really mad at me. Okay, this is me at A, and I'm responding to Christine's anger. Um, okay, let me get this straight. You think I'm always sending it on myself. I don't care what you need, and, you know, it's always about me. Did I miss anything? Oh, I'm stupid too. So you can see in that absurd example, I'm listening to you, even through your anger. That alone has an enormous calming effect because when you show up with C, I'm going to hang in there with you. And I always tell couples, you got to do that for four minutes. Um, from C, it has to be a qualitative C that you're not relying upon anger. You're just using the feeling. And the feeling, for example, would be, this is another one I do with Christine, when you don't call me, uh, it makes me feel at times I don't matter. And also, I had thoughts that something happened to you when you were late. And you can see, she can identify where I am when I'm that descriptive. I'm not just relying upon anger. And I remember she responded to me at that moment by going, uh, oh, geez, Tom, I'm sorry. I don't want you to feel like I get something went wrong. And yes, I care. I, I can call you. Um, so does that make sense? Okay. So let me move on. When he's at A and she's at C, when she's at C, he needs to be at A. So I'm looking at the relationship to be able to do both these things. It has to go back and forth. I'm also looking for Occasionally, it needs to be A to A. Can you sense when this is necessary? I, I, I kind of gave you a hint before. When do we have to be at A to A for a couple? When you really need to make decisions, uh, you know, rational decisions for do we go to holiday in one place or the other? You, you, you need to be A to A. because yes. otherwise. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. There's times both adults in the room have to show up. Um, so we definitely want that uh, occasionally, not all the time. And then to finish the sequence, uh, the other thing I'm looking for that I never want is this, C to C. Can you feel what, what this is going to show up like when a couple is here? Um, it's going to be a disaster. Is This is where couples really destroy their relationship because there's no adult in the room. They're both coming from a strong need. They're almost desperate to get affirmation and some consoling from the other person, but they're interjecting so much intensity into the relationship that the structure cannot contain it. So the rule is, whoever gets C first, whoever gets C first, keeps it until they're done. Um, that's how it's got to work. So we're building. Tom, Tom, quick question. Yep, please. So, so what an inhibited childish play, or or just a like free flow creativity, or something like that, yes. or maybe sex uninhibited sexuality, or. Yep. Yes. Um, that's good, Martin. Very rarely do people ask me that question, uh, except I was doing a, a lecture in a church once, and the pastor of all people in front of his congregation, 
<laughs> you know where I'm going. I mean, I almost died. He goes <laughs> to me, what about right at the height of sexual experience where you're both having an orgasm, enjoying it? Isn't that C to C? And I'm like, wow, I want to join this church. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and also, as Ed, you said, in playful behavior, it can be that also. Um, that can be happening also. But for, the, but for the sake of people understanding this, I kind of structure it. But like any models, it has its limit. It, it, it's not a buried tablet in the ground. It works everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But, yeah, I want to add, uh, you are more looking for helping people to come out of problems. So uh, what you are saying is more the problematic uh, CNC and uh, uh, relationship, no? So, yeah, I think it comes from that, that you didn't uh, just want to describe all relationships between uh, between men and women, uh, but probably the ones which are you know that they're in trouble a little bit exactly that's you your work in in therapy you you wouldn't therapy do therapy to people happily doing child to child interactions and 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 you know playfully that they don't need you so that's that's absolutely true uh heidi that uh people are solidly at the relational <laughs> level they don't come into therapy um <laughs> it's people at the role stage that always come in but to go back to what Martin said previously, they can look like they're not in a lot of conflict, but say if they're conflict avoidant and they're just getting along, on the surface, that can look really good. Like a physician referred a couple to me a couple weeks ago, and I saw him at a, um, a staff meeting recently, and he was shocked that this couple was in that much trouble. And... I mean, you don't know what goes on behind closed doors. It, it can look on the surface really good, but and they only have to be in conflict, but they're still not doing this structure, you know, this back and forth structure real well that they have to do. Can I move on? Yes, please. Okay, so let's get back over here real quick. Oops, I didn't do that, did I? Can you see the screen okay? But it's still with Martin on the... On okay, the... there we go. So we're building complementary flexible relationships while we manage the regression that I wanted to go back and forth. And on this screen, I couldn't get these lines to go back and forth, so I, I drew lines between each one. But as I listen to a couple deal with their relationship, I'm looking for this interactional sequencing from A to C. I'm looking how they signal each other and whether or not it works. So I got some questions for you. What would you speculate about a relationship that does primarily this, where the man's always at A and the woman's always expressing the feeling at the relationship at C? Um, what would you say about that relationship? I would say it's more like father and child, father and daughter, somehow. So she can get away with all sorts of things and will be like, you know, <laughs> give me that and give me, you know, and he will comply more or less uh, because he wants or because he feels obliged to. Absolutely. Do you have anything there, Martin? Yeah, maybe a trophy wife, a princess. You know. Yes something like that, or also, yes. That's yes. the first thought that comes up. Yes. Older man, younger woman, you know, we see often. That's absolutely right. Every one of those configurations um, fit this relationship. And Heidi, kind of similar to what you said, this relationship's rigid, complementary, traditional. And you can see in the language I came up the word rigid, complementary, traditional, even before I knew integral. And um, it is very traditional. This is all there was for the longest times. This was the role stage of development when, they were, when the green stage, the relational, wasn't online yet. 
But a deeper dive, what happens, he says to her, I won't make you grow up and be strong if you don't make me feel weak and impotent. And Yergi Willie's work talked about couples and collusion. And there's an emotional collusion here not to have to experience all aspects of the relationship. Because we got to remember, it's not until the 60s that we actually tried to have egalitarian relationships where men got more in contact, you know, with their uh, feminine side and women got more in contact with uh, power and agency. So previously, this collusion was culturally prescribed. Make yeah, and, yeah, can I say something? And I think that's Please. exactly what then women felt that they are pressed into into the child role, let's say, and where they try to, to want to come out. I think that could have been the origin of, of feminism because they want to become an adult and at the same level. Yes. Um, Christine did a presentation at San Diego Integral talking about the developmental necessity to do a traditional relationship through time. You know, um, and because you, a woman and the children really need to be with the baddest guy around because it was tribal. And, you know, it was kind of like survival of the fittest. Some of those aspects of Darwinianism was online. And of course, you know, any stage of development shows its repressive limiting aspect, but we're not that far out of that stage yet. Um, you know, I always say mid sixties that the relational stage came online, um, but this has got to work. Okay, let me go back and get us a little further down the line on this. And I almost got this down. Okay, what would you say about a relationship stuck in this direction where the woman's always at A and the man's always at C? Um, this is gonna test your ability. Any ideas? Yeah, I would say that um, <laughs> in German, we, we have a um, caricature where the woman is with a, um, a, a wooden stick behind the door when the man comes home, you know, uh, and she is the real, um, how to say, the boss in the, in the house and, is, and he becomes like something. Yeah hidden or uh, uh, how did you say before impotent sort of impotent he, she is taking the power away of the of the child she doesn't want the child to grow i mean the man to grow but i i guess some mothers do that also to their children so that might then become uh in adult life it might become a pattern so right um although i want to articulate on the power Power and role a little bit different because I'm going to add power to this model uh, in a few minutes. Um, if she's not expressing feeling and she's just, and she may indeed have power too, as you said, Heidi, but if she's not expressing power, she's in, she's at A. Did you want to say anything on this, Martin? Well, have I could potentially it? also see a cougar or something like that in, in a more modern, postmodern sense. Woman? Oh, oh cougar. A cougar, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you quite understand your accent. Right. What is that? Excuse me, I don't know what that is. Cool. It's a, um, uh, it's a like a lion, a feline uh, cat, a cougar. Oh. Uh, and culturally, it's used as a very powerful, strong woman, um, whatnot. Having a, a much a younger boyfriend, a boy toy. You know? <laughs> right. So if I go back, I want to show you what this is, and move that, I'm almost there. Okay, this relationship is rigid, complementary, non-traditional. And I always find, I find professional women occasionally tend to get in this type of relationship. And I think of it as they had to fight so hard to get power and legitimacy that if they make the mistake of picking a guy that's always going to be at sea, that teddy bear type of guy 
you know, that, that little boy in time, they can't stand it, you know, because it feels like the emotional burden, the same thing in the traditional configuration. Um, they can't stand it uh, in doing that. And be, because she can't feel the femininity. And those of you that have read David Data, he has a lot to talk about the polarity between the masculine and the feminine. Because when we go back to the traditional role stage, you know, we want to be able to access, you know, that polarity that's always been online occasionally. Uh, that's transcend include, not exclude. So this is rigid comp uh, non-traditional. Makes sense? Yeah, Tom, would you say, I mean, uh, American Beauty comes to mind for me. Would you say what uh, Kevin Spacey moves into at the beginning of the movie, where he becomes, you know, by traditional standards, irresponsible, quits his job, starts to smoke pot, while his wife is pursuing a career? Would that be something like that? And he lusts after, you know, his, daughter, his daughter's girlfriend. You know, I'm, I'm not that familiar that with that kind movie, of dynamic, but it sounds, it, yes, it sounds like that. It, it really does. Um, I can't think of any other popular show where it's non-traditional. That's a good point. I should try to think of some popular I mean, shows. As, in as good as it gets, maybe you also see a little bit that role between Helen Hunt and uh, Jack Nicholson, where she's usually the adult in the room and he's, you know. Yeah, anyway. like he, irresponsible guy and he's all he's always leaning on her emotionally mm -hmm. yeah that sounds right i i do remember that one a little bit that's a good point i'm gonna i'm gonna dig up some of those shows and whatnot yeah okay okay to go back share okay so um We've already touched on this one a little bit. Speculate if it's stuck in this configuration all the time, um, uh, which is rare. Um, what would you say if it was stuck A to A all the time? What would you say about that relationship? I would say that it becomes boring because there are only there might not be a lot of feeling. It is just you know. Uh, business as usual they organize their days and their life together but you know as, as if it was work something like that uh, it looks like like my marriage like <laughs> no polarity no sex uh, and you know no emotions conflict avoidant um, but very pragmatic and very solid in some way Right, exactly. Uh, this couple really opts for stability and predictability over vibrancy. Now, I rarely see a relationship like this. The last one I saw, um, they were, they both were engineers. And the presenting problem was we don't have any um, uh passion in our relationship yeah, no play that's why i checked in on the child child earlier right because i was missing play and lightness and frolicking and you know right they sacrifice all of that for the stability so if we look at their developmental history up in the upper left they either had role models that were afraid of it also or conversely there was such trauma they opted for stability above all of the costs. And of course, the shades of gray in all of this, isn't it? It's all contextual. The shades of gray in all of this that can limit the vibrancy of intimacy once we have an operating system and we understand how to tweak it to a degree to bring out the uh, best in everything. Okay, let's keep moving. And then I should know this. Okay. Um, these are called symmetry at A, which is far less conflictual. Symmetry at C, which is a disaster. Symmetry at C, as opposed to complementary. Remember, we want complementary. We don't want symmetry other than when it's needed at A. 
Um, the symmetry at sea, this couple, I can hear them walking up from the parking lot. They're yelling at each other. They're yelling in the waiting room. They're yelling in my office. And, you know, sometimes I have a whip and chair and I'm taking control of the session because I'm not going to let them self-destruct. I have to create a safe environment. Okay. I want to add one more concept. And Heidi, you already intimate this concept with the scenario you came up with a non-traditional configuration. And it's the issue of power. Power is the ability to influence. Who has the most influence in the relationship? Among children, who has the most influence in the family? So, uh, many times when I'm doing family work, I have a child that's absolutely running the family with chaos. And we can all see we're at a distance. Why do those parents let the children get away with that? And what they do is they let their love get in the way of their authority. And children need both the structure of authority and the love. Um, but when you get in the middle of it, it's easy to get control, uh, confused in it. So in the relationship, um, oh, yeah, these are examples of uh, power. Like one husband was brought into therapy for me, with me, because um, he was viewing erotica on um, the computer and his wife was absolutely incensed, you know, obviously because she felt it a threat to their relationship. And he was dragged into therapy doing that. That tells me right up front when I spoke with her on the phone that this woman has a lot of power. And... I'm also speculating that moment she occupies the C position because she was so affected by, you know, uh, that even in this day, it shouldn't be too uh, surprising for most women, unless they're at a traditional level, that men are uh, stimulated by erotica and whatnot. But there's a lot of relationships that can't handle that. Does that make sense why it suggests power? Mm -hmm. And on the other slide, what I'm talking about, uh, the, the wife is lying a lot in the relationship. And then what I realized is she's lying because she's so afraid of his reaction. But in each instance, that's the issue of power, which is very important in the relationship. So to move along a little bit on this. Uh, okay, we did those examples. Let's get down the road. All right, these cartoons show the power, non sequitur. And he's reading the vowels he let her write. And the vowels say, and no matter what, and no matter what, I'll always be wrong till death do us part. And then it's titled, The Importance of Writing Your Own Vowels. Um, on the next one, the guy is in therapy and he's grabbing the psychologist's head and he's writing uh, down on his pad. My wife says I have control issues. So if the therapist doesn't get, he has power and control issues. Um, he's, uh, he's pretty blind at that point. So the question becomes in the relationship, where is power? Does it reside with the man in a traditional configuration or with the woman? It, it could go either way. Is power at A in the traditional where the male's at A and the woman's at C? Or is it at C? So here's rigid complementary traditional power at A. Here's rigid complementary to traditional power at C. These are very different relationships. Heidi, on your example, I thought you were, your example was kind of from C because she's a little girl, she's creating chaos. You know, everything's about her. You know, she's demanding things. He, he's um, impotent. That felt like power at C. Um, otherwise, you know, you know, it would be very different. Uh, 
a description of what it would be. Yeah, can I ask a question? I, I think about my family, my mother, my father. My father was very, you know, a person, a public person, a politician and so on. And my mother felt with five children and she was overwhelmed and um, yeah. She, she was an Enya type 4, I would say, and so was she, she was a victim. And she always thought she is a victim. But I come to understand that she had the power in the family. So, yeah. you know, is it C? Probably, no? Because when you are a victim, you probably are in C. Yes, that's exactly the nuances of all of this. Um, before Integral, you know, when I developed some of this, I had no idea why I was doing these things, why I was mapping it in this fashion. And it was only after like about eight years of experience that I'm going, whoa, I keep seeing these patterns. Can you diagram them out? And I was actually doing a presentation once and, and the, the map started to appear to me because somebody asked me a question at the right moment. Isn't it fun when things emerge like that? And then through the years, I really articulated it out. But there is an academic paper on my website, drtomhabibi.com, where um, it's really articulated out. It's fit in all the literature and whatnot. But you're getting a good thumbnail sketch on this one. Um, should I move on? Yeah, so you would agree that it's a C position uh, of the power of the woman. I most certainly do. It sounds like she was at C. And she was overwhelmed and everything else at that moment. There's no doubt about it. But she was using her power to try to get more involvement and more help. But I'm not sure she really got his respect. Does that sound right? Yeah, respect maybe, but he more uh, reacted and responded in being more away from, her, from home than to be, you know. So that's the typical avoidance thing. That the, yes, yeah. yes, that he started to distance as part of that. And there's, there's actually a little map I can show you on that. Um, you know, when the couples are distancing, the other one's pursuing and whatnot. But that would make total sense. And I agree, she had power at sea. Uh, the relationship was traditional, but power at sea. But you can get a feel how different that relationship, if power is at A, She's not going to be that verbal. She's going to be a little more mousy. You know, she's going to be afraid of the daddy figure uh, and things like that. Okay. So moving along. Share. Get over there. Okay. So now, likewise, we can be rigid, complementary, non-traditional. This is where the woman isn't expressing any feeling and she has power. And when it's rigid like this, um, she's going to be frustrated as hell. Like I have a couple like this at this point and he doesn't want to have sex and he's totally unaware why and he has some problems maintaining the erection and sh she's angry and frustrated and the normal feminine that would evoke the masculine response is absent. And likewise, it can be rigid, uh, complementary, non-traditional power at sea. This relationship, I'll never forget, uh, I worked with one recently. She was the breadwinner of the family. She was doing all the work in the family and he was aligning with the children making fun of her. I mean, it was brutal that, you know, she was almost like a slave in the family. She never got a turn. Nobody ever supported her. And uh, I was able to shift the power. She was a very, very bright woman and got it. And boy, I got her the power immediately, um, and which got his attention. And um, that one went pretty well. Uh, once I was able to get it under control. So here's the test part uh, coming up. So the answer is A or C, adult or child. Where were you? Why didn't you call if you knew you weren't going to make the office party? 
Is she a C or A? You know, I would say it depends a little bit also how she how she sees speaks it. When she said, uh, "Let me see, where were you? Why didn't you call if you knew that you weren't going to make the office party?" You know, but, then she but, says it in this. Then she is definitely in C. But when she said, "Where were you? Why didn't you call if you knew that you weren't going to make the office party?" Then I would say she is in in A. What would you say, Martin? Yeah, I, I feel a little bit with Heidi too. That that isn't really clear to me. So she's actually at C, regardless of how she says it. She's asking for something. And even though she may not be expressive in terms of the feeling, so it's very clear she has a need. And I would work on that. If if it was your second configuration, Heidi, where it was kind of flat and controlled you know i would tell this woman you know people respect you but they don't want to take care of you and when i point that out that hits a woman like a brick because usually she's a professional woman but she doesn't invoke empathy in men uh men are already not that attuned emotionally as it is and when a woman doesn't bring forth a nice thing, so uh, watch me redo it, Heidi. Where were you? Why didn't you call if you didn't know you were going to make the office party? Now, if he can't feel her at that level, he's pretty dense. Um, do, do we agree? I found it definitely differently, different when you say it like that, and it seemed to me more like it a child also yeah yeah it's more c she has a need and i want to reiterate for people listening being at c is not bad i always wish i could find another word than child but it was so perfect there's so many people talking about an inner child it's not bad it's a necessary thing okay so we know he's supposed to be at a right yeah, but let me uh, ask you you say because she is asking that question that it was mixed makes it C? Yes. Or, okay. Will you because she's example? expressing a need, right? A need. In, okay. in, in, mm -hmm. That she projects on him and doesn't make an I statement, right? How she feels. Right. Your she's point. expressing a need is a very good way to conceptualize it, Martin. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're feeling into is we're trying to be attuned to our partners and what they need. Now watch, if he responds, I was late because of last minute calls at work. <clears throat> you know how bad things are this time of year. I'll give you a hint. Who is he focusing on, himself or her? Uh, I think the first part is uh, focusing on himself and the second part on her. So um, he, he wants her to understand that it is always like this. While in the first part, he is giving an explanation of the facts. which. Right, uh, right. Even an explanation is trying to take the attention to himself. So at this point, he's at C because he's not focused on her. So you see why this has mm -hmm. to work in a relationship? It's got to be able to handle the nuances of the feeling. So let's do another one. You're right. I should have called. Who's he focusing on? On her. So he's at A. Right. Um, um, I wanted to talk to you about my visit to the doctor's office for my mammogram. Oh, I'm sorry. I already pulled it up. But it's pretty <laughs> clear she's at C, right? Because she's, she went to the physician. She's having a mammogram. Of course she's afraid. So now watch. Sure, I know how you must be feeling. It must be like how I felt waiting for my chest x-ray to come back. Is he at A or C? A. Heidi? I would say C because he is relating it to himself. He is taking her statement to talk about himself. Very good, Heidi. Okay. It's C because... It's not his turn. I want him to feel into, oh, honey, how did it go? 
Uh, when are you going to get the results? I want him to be there. He's referencing it about himself. Haven't we always run? Haven't we run into people that always make it about themselves? And it's annoying. It, it's a form of narcissism when it's habitual like that. So if he says in response to that, how did it go? Is it A or C? That would be A now because he wants to know more about her inner state and about her fears and whatever. What do you think, Martin? Okay, first I have two thoughts. First, it was not, maybe it's now clear when I look at it. I thought she wanted to talk to him about her feud that she will go to the doctor, but that was my misinterpretation. Um, yeah, but she already went. She already went. And second, what, what comes up for me is that in, in a different voice, Kara Gilligan writes, men try to understand others by understanding themselves, by, while women try to understand themselves by understanding others. So maybe that's a male uh, condition, you know, to in order to relate to someone else's experience that they have to relate it to their own experience. It's probably very hard to transcend for men. Well, and I don't have a problem with that, Martin, is, you know, once the relationship is working well, and if they use each other's content to go back and forth like that, mm. and they shift real quickly, I'm fine with that. But there has to be a fundamental grounding that I'm going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to recognize those moments, you know, where, you know, I'm really making it about you for a moment. Because think of the stability that creates. So once the relationship's stable at that, you know, they might quickly go, you know, whoa, that was something you said. But there's a, there's a tacit agreement that I'm going to give up that position because I know you give it to me too. So I'm fine with that articulation once the relationship is solid. And I think that's what you're articulating because, because of the complementary, I mean, I'm sorry, the traditional nature of a relationship, I totally agree that men will utilize a woman's emotional state in order to discover things about themselves. Mm. Does that make sense? or relate i mean i i don't know how, how much slack we have to give men or ask women for understanding is that i mean i noticed that too that i can better relate empathetically to somebody else if i can relate it to one of my own experiences and and okay you could interpret it as as narcissistic or self-centered but uh you know i think men have a hard time to empathize with somebody else with having had that experience themselves. No doubt. That is the definition yeah. of empathy versus sympathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy is a level of familiarity and resonance. But yes, because of the traditional natures of society today, we're behind the uh, eight ball emotionally. Mm -hmm. And we still haven't had masculinism that's going to really will open up the portals of the interchange. So yeah, we, we do rely upon a uh, woman in many ways to invoke that mm. uh, and do that. Can I move on? Yes. So going back real quick. Okay. How did it go? That's A, because he's only focused on her. Mm -hmm. Don't you just hate going to the doctor? Now remember our trick here. Is it her or him? Is this A or C? Oh no, it's a projection, I would say, on her. An assumption. So go ahead, pick one. I was wrong before, so I pick C in that case. <laughs> You pick what? I pick C, Charlie. It is C. Yeah, because I would have that too. Mm -hmm. He's looking for affirmation. Don't you just hate going to the doctor? It's mm -hmm. not his turn. He can't do it right now. Uh, 
Uh, but Tom, if he had said, uh, I know that you don't like to go to the doctor, then it would be A. Oh. That's right. If he focuses on her, I know you don't like going there. That can't be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's So, I mean, I'm realizing these are hard. I develop these when I'm training uh, psychologists for therapy. Uh, I, I did this recently with Jeff Salzman. Uh, you're, you're actually doing slightly better than he did. He only got one right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm realizing because I did uh, develop these for uh, psychologists, they're a little bit hard for people that don't do this a lot mm. and don't recognize the territory, but you can see how well this has to work and why couples end up with so much problems, uh, in doing this. Okay. Moving on. I want to get through this section and so we're going to do a new new one she's clearly at c you can't get anything right are you brain damaged you screw everything up um so that's not a good c right because she's using anger and he says don't call me brain damaged a or c c c for sure you guys see you're ahead of jeff mm -hmm. okay now this one's tricky if he responds to her calling him brain damage and he's just silence until the rage is vented. It's also what a C. Might, huh? It's also a C. What do you say, Heidi? Um, probably it would be A, but in some people, when you stay silent, the other one gets even more crazy. So depends on the on the dynamic of the of the couple. Oh, I, that's very good is it's a question mark you both were right it depends both on the dynamic and his body language mm. if he's cowering under the table he's at sea well i looked if at the picture so <laughs> right i know the picture's silly if um he's clearly at sea in the picture you're absolutely right mm. but if he's just showing strength and holding it for her and silent until the rage is vented it's A. So you actually did really well on that one. Calm down. Let me explain. I tried to get Joey to pick up the playroom, but he had a report due tomorrow. That's, I, would, I would say C. Uh, yeah, C. Me too, C. Yep. You guys are way ahead. Uh, calm down. Tell me what's wrong. That's tricky. Which part is tricky, Martin? To calm down because that's sort of like yes, uh, telling her what to do. Yeah. Yes, that's his need. Yeah. So I have this one, A, but you're absolutely right, Martin. Somebody pointed that out three months ago at a professional presentation. Mm -hmm. Isn't that him asking for something in the moment? Yeah. And I winced and I went, ooh, you're right. I just haven't had a chance to fix it. Yeah. So you, you you know, the second part is okay, I guess, right? Yeah. And yeah. if you had the, the model of adult, child, and um, what was it, parent or something, yeah, then that would be the parent part. Yes. The, and in yeah. traditional tran, uh, transactional analysis, where they use the PAC, that would be called parental. But I'm mm -hmm. calling that C because they're asking for something, even mm -hmm. in that parental role. Um, I could never make that P fit. All right, watch this one. He waits till later that evening. Susie, you were really upset this afternoon. Can we talk about whether or not you feel you can depend upon me? This is A. Yes, A. Yeah, would this couple ever go to therapy? <laughs> mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he... these are the couples who go to therapy. <laughs> say, again, say again, Martin? Well, these are the couples who are practically constantly in therapy, either with each other or with uh, a therapist right. who guides them ongoingly to their relationship. Yes. Right, except the last one. I mean, if he really yeah. has the wherewithal to pull his yeah. stuff together and control the moment yeah. and wait till later that evening yeah. to recognize, you know, she feels like she can't go there. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe I they're post-therapy. Yeah. No, no man grows up in a way without help to be like that, I would say. 
Well, down the road, I hope, I hope, you know, we become fluent enough in recognizing mm -hmm. vulnerability that we can really do that. Okay. But you can see why at the relational level, this structural stuff is uh, really, really important. So how are we doing time-wise, Heidi? We are over time, but I, I would say you can continue so we get it through. Okay. Why don't I do a few and we can post it? Because I don't want to go too, too far over. Uh, actually, I have to get the office in it. anyways. So yeah. I'm going to do a couple of these and then we'll uh, end this. So going back here real quick. They are fun, Tom. Uh, and moving on. So the 12 rules of adult child. Whoever gets C first keeps it until they're done. Number one rule, when you at C, know what you want. Don't even go to C until you have an idea of what you want. So in this one, one of the ways I experience this, and I know I'm at C, like say if Christine really upsets me, in my head I'm going, geez, why did I ever marry her? God, she never can be there with me. I, it's too hot. I'm not going to start talking right there. I'm not ready. I have to answer the question, what do I want? What do I want? All right. I want her <clears throat> to check with me before she makes plans to go out and do an event. I want to be able to say yes or no. Okay, now I'll ask for what I want. Because now the quality of my C is going to be better. Does that make sense? Whoever gets C. Say again? In the sense that whoever understands first that the other person is in C. I'm rephrasing gets, your first sentence. Yeah, whoever gets C first, they go there because they have a need. You know, I want to talk to you about something today. They're at C. So whoever gets it first gets to keep it until oh, they're done. Uh -huh. Okay. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then the second one is the quality of C. Uh, the third one I can just tell you verbally is anger is always C, but it's poor quality. And we've said that uh, through this presentation. Um, so what I'll do is I'll post the rest of these. Can we, can we put them on the website, Heidi? Yeah, I would love to have this uh, PowerPoint. That would be great. Okay. We so, can post it on both websites. If you send it to me, I post it on the wisdomfactory.com on your page, on the event page, which yeah. is wisdomfactory.com, Tom Habib. Uh, yeah. And then we can also put it on your website and downloadable so people can have that. Yeah. Well, I'll pull out the 12 rules so people can review them themselves. Awesome. Now that they know what this AC is, they're all been flexible complementary relationships, never mm -hmm. go here. It's okay to be here at times. Mm -hmm. The 12 rules will really make sense to them. Good. So, good enough for now? Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great, Tom. Yeah, it was fun, this, this exercises, and I would like to do more of those. And I think that's really <laughs> where we can uh, maybe inspire people to think about that, you know, mm -hmm. about their own behavior with these examples. So, Really great. Do you have more or only these? Do I have more? Examples? I think we skipped a few, I think. Ah, right? okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I need to wrap up right here. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having me on. I always enjoy being on the Wisdom Factory. I uh, appreciate, obviously, the Wisdom Factory is where I first got to share my work. And I'm forever indebted to you guys. Thank you. Well, to Heidi and Mark. Uh, our yeah. late Mark. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a shame that he isn't here because he really could have said something out of his experience too, and he would have enjoyed that mm -hmm. a lot. We so, all miss Mark. Yeah, quite a bit. But thank you to have been with us again, and uh, let us uh, keep up with what you are going, what you are doing, and mm -hmm. whenever new findings, new ideas come up, let me know. Okay. Most certainly. Okay, yeah, and Tom. thank you. Yeah, thank Bye, everyone. you, everybody, and also who has watched live and who will watch later on video. Thanks, and connect with Tom on Dr. Tom, Dr. D. R. 
um, uh, termhabib.com and with me, the westernfactory.net. And uh, Martin has his own website. Do you want to say that? Yeah, it's integralrelationship.com. Mm -hmm, exactly. And don't hesitate to contact us. And if you have some ideas about, you know, about these tests and we could play together that would be fine <laughs> okay bye 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 now bye bye